Good morning, everybody. I was just thinking there that the sound of the heating winding down is a, sounds a bit like me when I'm trying to get out of my bed. <laughs> the groans that it was making as it was going, ah, it's like me and I'm going, ah, trying to get out of my bed. Terrible, isn't it? It's getting old. Yeah, yeah, I know, okay. Have you been keeping well? Aye. And the weather's been nae bad, as Steve would say. Nae bad. Well, I know I've been heck of a busy, so I'm, I'm just really glad that today is Sunday. I actually have my car. My daughter doesn't. <laughs> so it means I don't have to go anywhere. I can please myself. So the only place I'm going after church today is him. I'm not going anywhere else. I'm not caring. So, let us come together and worship God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, from whom all things have come, this day, yesterday, and forever. Absolutely brilliant. So our first hymn this morning is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
Joyce, would you, you made the mistake of smiling at me there. Would you like to come up and light the candle for me this morning, please? There you go, you just press the big button, my darling. And if there's anybody that you want to say a prayer for, just say, say their name. Okay. Oh. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joyce. Let's join our hearts together. Let us pray. Holy, 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 our Creator, Father in heaven, how truly amazing you are. You create everything seen and unseen, heard and unheard, touched and untouched. From the smallest to the greatest, all things have known your touch as you bound together whatever you thought was needed and made miraculous things. From the furthest star to the person sitting close beside you, your hand is held each as if it were the most precious. Lord Jesus, with our Father in heaven, you teach us how to love how to love the animals lent to us to look after, sometimes for a few years, so they become part of our immediate family and cherished by us until you decide it is time for them to return to you. You teach us how to love one another, showing respect and care for each other, just as you did when you walked on earth. Sometimes we have people in our lives for a short time and sometimes for a lifetime. Each person, though, is made in your image and each person is treasured by you and you ask us to treasure them too. Each person gives us an opportunity to learn, to learn about them, about a situation and about ourselves. Holy Spirit, alongside our Lord Lord Jesus and our Creator, Father in heaven, you created the heavens and earth. We can only imagine what it was like when your Spirit swept over the earth while it was still a formless void, what it was like when the earth took shape and form. You help us and guide us. You support us in times of trouble and enable us to achieve many things as we go about our lives not noticing you there beside us and in us. Father, Jesus, Spirit, we are sorry for the times we have not noticed you or the things you have done with us, for us, and through us. We are truly selfish, only considering what you can do for us rather than what we can do for you. We are sorry for claiming all successes as being of our own doing, not acknowledging that everything comes from and through you. In the silence, Lord, bring to our minds those times we have not lived as you would have us live, done as you would have us do, or said what you would have us say. Loving God, you have cleansed our hearts and forgiven us our sins through the life, death, and resurrection of your only Son, Christ Jesus. Increase our understanding and sensitivity until we have a deeper knowledge of the mind of Christ. Hear us now as we say the prayer he taught us, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this 
debt, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And our next hymn this morning is, O God, Thou Art the Father. We come to the reading of the scriptures. Our first reading today comes from James, from chapter 2, reading verse 14 to 26. Let us hear the word of God. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you stops to say to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was it not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. 
and he was called, called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And our next reading is from the Gospel of Mark, reading from chapter 4, verse 30, and the parable of the mustard seed. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Amen and thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word this day. And our next hymn this morning, because my tablet has just decided to switch itself off, is Today I Wake and God is Before Me. I love the last line of that hymn. They call me to life and call me their friend. Isn't that just lovely? You get that, well, I get this lovely, warm, hugging feeling from that line. It's just beautiful. We come now to the sermon, so let us pray. 
O holy God in heaven, bless these words this day and bless our minds and our hearts so we can learn to love and trust you alone. Amen. Does anyone know which trees grow the tallest? Clever girl, yes, well done. I used to think it was the Scots pine, you know, because they are magnificent, aren't they? The Scots pine. But perhaps that's because I remember seeing them in particular as a child walking through the forest when we were up at Loch Garden, you know, looking for the ospreys, as we did quite a lot when I was a child. I do think they are very tall and magnificent. But no, I was wrong, and yes, you were quite right, Audrey. It is, in fact, the redwood of America. Do you know why they are the tallest? They've got good genes, yes, and it's not the Levi's. <laughs> well, funnily enough, it's because the air is so moist. Yes, even more moist than Scotland. The air is so moist that the leaves don't have to fight, you know, they don't have to fight for the, the liquid, the nutrients to come up just from the roots. They manage to draw it in from the moisture so therefore the tree grows even taller. And the king of these giants is called the Hyperion and is a whopping 115.92 meters. You'll understand that, Philip. I don't understand it at all. It's 380.3 feet. So that's tall, you know? In comparison, the Scots pine can grow to 36 metres or 120 feet. You know, so pretty good, but less than a third of the redwood. But it's not a competition, you know? It's really not a competition, thank goodness. Each tree has got its own purpose and each does the best it can. The mustard tree, and you can see on the picture, oh, Sam, where's my picture? Oh, you've been waiting. Oh, oh, he's been waiting. Oh, see that? Can you see the seed in that fingers? It's tiny. Those of us that are real shepherdesses, you've maybe got a, a thing, a dish of mustard seeds that you grind when you're cooking, don't you? If you're a real chef. <clears throat> okay, you just use the powder, same as me. But that seed is tiny, absolutely tiny. But the mustard tree, from that one single seed, can grow to 20 feet tall and as wide. 20 feet wide. So just think in that, that tiny, tiny mustard seed, this brilliant tree grows. God has shown many a time great things come from small seeds. And Jesus told many parables, some more memorable than others, if you're completely honest. But to me, the parable of the mustard seed is very, very short but it has great meaning. So Jesus said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all the garden plants with such big branches that birds can perch in its shade. So Jesus was trying to explain to the disciples what the kingdom of God is like. Now he knows because it's where he came from, you know, but I suppose it would be like someone who has traveled back in time to say the 1300s 
trying to explain to somebody what the internet is. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I use the internet and I don't understand it. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, it's a... Uh, what chance would a 13 person in the 1300s have, you know? So, but we know that the, the disciples were struggling with the concept of the kingdom of God. They are still focused on Jesus being the military leader who will overthrow the Roman conquerors and return the land to the Jews. But Jesus is not that person. He was on earth to save mankind from their sins. And this was not something that people would accept immediately. Instead, each would have to learn from Jesus what this would entail. It's not just a case of rolling over. Yeah, that's fine. No, 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 no. You've got to work for it. And remember, God gave each of us free will. So he does not and did not want to make us go to him. He doesn't want to make us. He wants us to do it freely. He doesn't use threats or anger to impel us to go to him. He wants us to go to him because we love him and we know that what he offers us is exactly what we need and what we want. So Jesus starts with the disciples and they can be a tough nut to crack. They have questions and more questions as they try to understand. And they ask him what the parables mean. I wonder sometimes if Jesus ever got frustrated with them. Probably not because he is God. Would he have gotten frustrated? No, that's a man's sin, isn't it? Getting frustrated. And remember, the first disciples Jesus called were Simon, Peter, and Andrew. They were, they were fishing, but immediately followed Jesus when he called them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. I'm sure they must have been curious with that turn of phrase, fish for people. What does this man mean? So firstly, there was Jesus, the mustard seed, that tiny, tiny thing on the tip of the finger, that is Jesus. The seed was planted, he came to earth as a baby and he grew and grew into the man now teaching the disciples. The disciples, Simon, Peter and Andrew, John and James, Judas and Jude, James and Bartholomew, Philip and Thomas, Matthew and Simon. So this mustard seed grew into the baby Jesus, the man Jesus, his 12 disciples. And these 12 men would go out into the world and tell the good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God. From small seeds, great things grow. And of course, it wasn't just the 12 disciples. There were more and more followers, unnamed, and wherever they went, more joined. And we know one of the most prolific writers in the New Testament, Paul, was commissioned by God to teach the Gentiles to go further out into the world as they knew it. And he traveled far and wide, teaching, performing miracles, telling the story of Jesus. And this was not always welcomed or accepted. But even so, churches were started in Galatia, in Corinth, Philippi, Ephesia. Amazing. The disciples and other followers had to change in order to achieve this. And God gave each of them what they needed to succeed, even enabling them to speak in foreign languages. 
Remember from Acts 2, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. These early believers perhaps had it easier than those of us who are over 2,000 years later. Admittedly, they had to deal with being persecuted, perhaps killed for following Jesus. Sadly, this still happens in some places today. But we have the benefit of all the early believers telling their stories passing on the knowledge and experience of being Christians. We can talk and debate mostly quite openly what the Bible tells us. There are online groups you can join. There are Bible study groups. And unlike the early believers, certainly in this country, we don't have to hide the fact that we believe. However, being closer in time to Jesus meant that you might be or know someone who met him in the flesh, was transformed in some way by what he said or did. We, however, have to rely on our faith. And our reading from James tells us that having faith alone is not enough. We need to exercise our faith by action. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep well and warm fed, keep warm and well fed even, but then you don't do anything about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. So true faith transforms our conduct as well as our thoughts. It's all very well feeling sorry for someone's circumstances, but doing nothing about it shows we do not truly believe the truths we have been taught. We cannot earn our salvation by serving and obeying God, but doing so shows our commitment to him. Now, the reading from James could be seen as refuting what we learned in Romans. For it says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. But this is not the case. Paul in Romans is speaking against those who try to be saved by deeds instead of true faith. James, meanwhile, is speaking against those who confuse intellectual agreement with true faith. After all, even demons know who Jesus is, but they don't obey him. So true faith means commitment of your whole self to God. James said, Abraham was considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. So Abraham believed in God and was willing to obey him. So true faith always results in good deeds but the deeds do not vindicate us. Faith brings us salvation. Act of obedience shows our faith is genuine. 
So like the mustard seed, our faith starts out small, maybe just a tiny, tiny flicker. Doing good following the teachings of Jesus fans our faith into a stronger and brighter flame, which can illuminate others to find the love, joy, peace, and mercy of our Lord Jesus. Sometimes our faith might take a knock, become a cross, or experience something that makes us question our faith, question God. And this is exactly the time that we need to speak with God, tell him exactly what we are feeling. Even if we feel angry at him, tell him. You know, he's got broad shoulders, he can take it. If we feel that God has forgotten about us, tell him. And tell him if we feel that he's done something terrible. Remember how Moses stood up to God for his people in the desert. He was not shot down with a bolt of lightning. He survived and went on to live a long life. God, our God, is a gracious God. He's merciful and kind, loving and forgiving. Most of all, he is faithful to us. He never gives up on us, so we should never give up on him. Amen, and thanks be to God for these considerations of his holy word. And our next hymn this morning is The Reign of God Like Farmer's Field. join together now as we pray for others. Let us pray. Lord, help us to break down the prejudice held against other nations and peoples. Help us to find a way to live in peace with honour. We think in particular of the peoples in the Middle East fighting and hating each other sending bombs and firing guns at one another instead of breaking bread and realizing each one is the same. 
Each one is made in your image, and each wants their family to be to live happy, secure, and free lives. Bless the work of all those who are bringing aid to the needy and helping to end the suffering. Show us how to bridge the gap between wealth and poverty, plenty and hunger. Lord, we ask for your help and guidance to all those whose work affects the lives of others. Give wisdom and integrity to our leaders, to those who serve in Parliament, especially those who serve in the government and have the heavy burden of decision-making and law-making. We remember the people who serve in trade unions, people who head our industries and businesses, the mass media and the social media. Help each of them do their utmost to ensure any decision they make does no harm to another. Loving God, we ask for your blessings on families on the bonds between parent and child, partners and support networks. Let there be a better understanding of each other and through this a deeper love for one another. Where there are troubles in the home, send your spirit to calm the storm. Give us strength when we are overstrained, guidance when we are perplexed, and courage when we are afraid. Although today we enjoy our day of rest, there are others for whom it is like any other day, people who must work on a Sunday so our lives can continue as usual, people whose responsibilities are always with them. We pray that in the midst of their activity and concern, they know the light of your truth. All over the world today, there are people who are suffering, suffering from illness and pain, suffering from hunger and poverty, suffering from loneliness and fear, suffering from bereavement and sorrow. We pray for an end to their suffering, Lord, that they may be comforted by the knowledge of your love and that we be used to help them wherever possible. Into your hands, Lord God, we commend ourselves and all the men, women and children of the world. May your will be done always and everywhere. Amen. Uh, intimations this week, um, next week it's harvest weekend. So on Saturday, 12 to 2, come and get your face painted. Sorry? 10 to 12. Sorry, not 12 to 2. 12 to 2. 12. Just listen, listen to me up front, the organiser hasn't got a clue. It is 12, 12 to 2. Dinner de to McLear. I've got it written down 12 to 2. 12 to 2. Come and get your face painted, Alan. I expect you to be leading the charge. Leading the charge. Come and get your face painted. I can see you as a lion. Oh, yes, a lion. So, face painting, crafts, and lots of different games, lots of things, and lunch. Eric, you'll get your dinner. You'll get your dinner. All are welcome. All ages, because we're all God's children. That's the thing. We're all kids at heart. And then on Sunday, it is 
our harvest Thanksgiving service, of course, but before that we've got community breakfast bops. Come and get your bacon and egg bop. Yes, so we are starting that at 9.30. 9.30. And then we have the harvest Thanksgiving service. So, of course, we'll be, if you can bring things in for the food bank, that would be great. We'll put them up front and then they'll get taken to the food bank. That would be fantastic. And, of course, the donations for the shoe boxes continue. Please, any donations you can, gratefully received, in particular toiletries, um, but everything, everything and anything, that would be great. And I think that are all our intimations. I'm just pleased I remembered to write them down this week, unlike last week. <laughs> oh boy, I could almost get good at this job, maybe, almost. Don't hold your breath though, guys, please, don't, don't, wouldn't be good. Right, so our final hymn this morning is, To God be the glory, great things he has done. And I think we all need to be standing and singing loud for this one.
you this day, tomorrow, and always. And all the people said together, Amen. And I hope you all have a blessed week. I hope you work hard, live hard, and pray hard all week. And we'll see you next week for a breakfast bath.